back. Um, but welcome, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Ted Blank, and I am with Travel Leaders Market Square Travel here in the Twin Cities. We are very excited to have you with us today. We're going to be going to some of the more exotic places in the world today with our friends at Ama Waterways. Um, so we're going to be going to the Nile River in Egypt, and then we're going to be heading to Southern Africa and the Chobe River, which um, probably is one that may not be as familiar to everyone. So thank you for joining us. I'd like to quickly introduce our guests and then I'll turn the presentation over to them. Um, we have Mary Margaret Ruther, who is with Amma Waterways and Mary Margaret is in um, suburban Chicago. And then we have Todd Nay, also with Amma Waterways. And Todd, are you in California right now? Uh, Los Angeles, yeah. Los Angeles, Los Angeles area, great, great. So I think we're set, we are live on Facebook. So I'm gonna turn it over to you Mary, Margaret, and Todd, um, and I'll mute myself and turn my video off and we'll get started with the presentation. For the folks who are attending, the um, Q&A box at the bottom of your screen is active. So if you have a question, just type it in there and um, if it's appropriate, we'll address it as we go. Otherwise, we'll save them for the end. So Mary, Margaret, and Todd, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Thank you so much, uh, Ted, very much. Um, and welcome, and I am very, very honored to introduce you to Todney. He is our product manager for not only Egypt, but also for Africa. So he is the one that's gonna take us on this magnificent journey. Um, so get your seatbelts on and let's go, Todd. All right, thanks, um, Mary, Margaret, and Ted. And uh, oh, we got a funny looking slide here with our names, but welcome travel leaders, consumer guests. Uh, Let's first talk about our new program uh, in Egypt. Uh, uh, first thing I'll point out is the uh, location of Egypt in the northeastern corner of uh, the continent of Africa. And on the map here, you can see Israel, Jordan, and the UAE. Uh, those are extensions that you can do before and after um, our program. And then on the map here, on the lower left-hand side, uh, just pay attention to Abu Simbel. I'll bring that up later on in the program. So our new program in Egypt is uh, begins with three nights in Cairo. Uh, then you fly about an hour south down to Luxor, which is where we board our ship. Seven nights on the Nile, and then we work our way back to Cairo for one night at the end. Our departures, we are starting to sail on the Nile this fall, starting in September, and it's weekly through uh, the end of December. And then we sail from January to June and September to December of 2022. Departures are weekly um, and we will be opening up for sale for 2023 um, probably in about three weeks. So let's first talk about Cairo itself where the program begins. Cairo is a massive city, huge city, 23 million people. And Cairo itself, an Arabic word meaning the conqueror. And you can see uh, through the heart of Cairo, um, the Nile flows through it. And the Nile itself, they say is the longest river in the world, 4,300 miles long. Um, but that's also in competition with the Amazon. The Amazon, they also say is the longest river in the world. It's right around 4,300 miles. The Nile actually begins up in uh, Ethiopia and in Lake Victoria, um, White Nile and the Blue Nile, and they merge together to form the Nile, which empties in to the Mediterranean Sea. A couple of fun facts about uh, Egypt itself. It's uh, been around since 3100 BC. Um, Cairo itself, like I said, 23 million people, even in the 14th century, over a half a million people were already living in uh, Cairo. Weekends in Egypt um, are happen to be Fridays and Saturdays as opposed to our Saturdays and Sundays. And the currency in Egypt is the pound. All right, let's first talk about our new ship, the Amadalia. And it's a new ship, sort of, uh, actually it's rebuilt because in, on the Nile, the, uh, you only allowed a certain amount of ships on the Nile and you get a license. They're not issuing any more licenses. So what we had to do was purchase a ship about a, uh, two years ago and we took it out of service, put it in a shipyard in Cairo. It's been in the shot Cairo shipyard, excuse me, for the last couple of years. We stripped it down to its bare bones 
down to its hull like a skeleton and re, uh, rebuilt it. The ship itself, 34 cabins, 18 standard cabins and uh, 16 suites. There's a pool. Actually, let's go through um, and I'll show you the layout of the ship. So there's five decks and the decks are named after plants or flowers that are um, grow in Egypt or even native to Egypt. And the lowest deck, the acacia deck are the uh, ca cabins with just a large uh, picture window, 196 square feet. And you work your way up the purple section there. These are uh, 226 square foot cabins and they come with a French balcony. And if you're not familiar with what a French balcony, it's kind of like a small balcony. You can't sit out on it. Uh, you can stand out on it, I guess. But um, you have uh, you know, sliding glass doors. So you get the, uh, the full uh, breeze coming in. And then uh, after that, the green, the turquoise, and the pink and the blue, those are uh, all suites that come with a balcony and or uh, French balcony. And you work your way up to the chef's table uh, on the jasmine deck. We'll have a massage room, nail salon, fitness room. We even have a wellness coach on board. So if you're into yoga or you know morning, exercise and stuff like that up on the deck, uh, we'll have a wellness coach on board. Another thing I'd like to point out is the Amadaya will have an elevator from the Acacia deck all the way up to the Jasmine deck. Number of guests on board, 68 passengers. So let's talk about the uh, top deck first. Uh, this is where we do have a swimming pool or kind of like a splash pool. Um, notice on the deck here that we do have a lot of canopies, uh, sun umbrellas, so on like that, it's because in Egypt, the sun shines pretty much all the time and uh, pretty strong at time, certain times of the year. It's a very, very dry climate. And to give you an idea how dry it is, uh, in, when I was at last in Luxor, I was with our uh, Egyptologist, Dina, and I said, Dina, gosh, this landscape just looks so dry, deserty, sand, stuff like that. When was the last time it rained here? And she said, honestly, 17, she shrugged her shoulders 17, 19 years ago. So it's an area of the world that really doesn't get a lot of rain. You may get a little bit in Cairo in December and January, um, but uh, that's about it. We'll also have an outdoor uh, restaurant. You can see that here um, on the uh, uh, top deck. And this is actually uh, my background also. This is the lobby or the entrance uh, on the way into the Amadali. You can see the Egyptian theme. And then we have a lounge, a bar. And uh, I don't know if you've been on our cruises in Europe and stuff, we have what we call a sip and sail. Sip and sail is like a happy hour. And happy hour, um, about an hour before dinner, you can all head up to the lounge and there'll be complimentary drinks. One day maybe local beer and wine, another day a cocktail of the day, all kinds of different things. So uh, happy hour or what we call sip and sail, uh, complimentary drinks for an hour before dinner. And then after dinner, uh, we will have nightly entertainment in the lounge, things like a belly dance show, maybe even a captain's cocktail party, different things. Um, what we call a galabaya party, which is would be like a uh, 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 costume party, all kinds of different things going in the lounge each night. In the restaurant, um, so you can see the design of the restaurant. The food in the restaurant will be continental, so, you know, your local cuisine that you're used to here in North America and Europe, but we'll also do a splash of Egyptian slash Mediterranean. So you'll get a choice of different things. If you're gluten-free, dairy-free, vegan, so on like that, definitely we can um, accommodate that. And then um, during lunch and dinner, complimentary wine, local wine and local beer are always included. And local beer in Egypt tends, to, well, right now uh, it's a beer called Stella and local wine in uh, Egypt. Well, you don't think of Egypt for local wine, and but there are vineyards, not many, not enough to support the local wine trade. And so a lot of the local, the grapes are imported to Egypt from South Africa and they mix it all up and then you get your uh, local wine. So we'll talk about, let's look at the suites. And this is uh, the suites again, anywhere from 370 to 400, uh, 10 square feet. They have a bedroom, a sitting lounge, and a bathroom. The bedding can be one bed or two. It's just up to you. Just let us know at the time of booking. 
This is a sitting lounge uh, in, in one of the suites. Remember, there's 16 suites. And I should tell you, whether you're in a suite or a standard cabin, you always get complimentary Wi-Fi and we'll always have uh, on-demand uh, TV. So you know, if you want some downtime, head to your room, things going on. This is a narrow view of kind of what the, the suites will actually uh, look like. Also in the suites, I just want to point out, I never knew this was important to a lot of guests, but it is. And uh, so we have a full tub in all the suites, a walk-in shower, and again, two sinks uh, in all the suites. The standard cabins, 226 square feet, come with the, the, like I said, the French balcony. Again, the bedding can be uh, one bed or two. And these are the uh, the cabins with the windows, the uh, uh, still big in terms of cabin size. Like I said, 196 square feet, lots of storage. And uh, again, complimentary Wi-Fi as well as on-demand TV. So that's the Amadaya. Let's talk about the program itself. And uh, so the way it works is you'll fly to Cairo from North America. Most flights into Cairo arrive late in the afternoon or in the evening. We'll meet you at the airport before immigration and assist you through immigration and then transfer you to the hotel. Everybody gets a transfer to the hotel. You don't need to buy our air or purchase transfers. It, it's all included. I should say that for Egypt, you do need a visa. It's not expensive. Um, uh, right now it's 25 US dollars and you can get it on arrival, but I recommend you apply for it online about an, a month before departure. Uh, fill out all the form, give me your credit card number and they'll send you a confirmation and bring that with you. If you don't, if you wait until you arrive in Egypt, uh, getting through immigration can be time consuming. And after a long flight, probably the best thing you wanna do is get through the immigration as fast as you can and to the hotel. Do you need any uh, mandatory vaccines or medication and stuff like that for now? The answer is no. Uh, there's no malaria in Egypt, so you won't have to worry about that. So we'll transfer you to the hotel. The hotel is the Four Seasons uh, at First Residence. You can see a picture of it here, 200 rooms. If you remember at the beginning, I kind of showed you that picture of Cairo, Central Cairo. This hotel is about a mile south of that. And we picked that because it's, uh, um, it's kind of more in a quiet zone, it's tranquility, because it's pretty chaotic there in downtown Cairo. And you can kind of see to the bottom right-hand side, uh, there's uh, trees and stuff like that. Those are the uh, botanical gardens. The Four Seasons, 200 rooms. And if you go to TripAdvisor, many hotel websites, you'll often find uh, this hotel uh, as a top rated in Cairo. So the rooms that you'll be staying in, are, they're called Superior Room and they're in the upper floor, sixth floor to the top. Um, the Superior Rooms come about 510 square feet. So they're big. They all have a partial view of the Nile, complimentary Wi-Fi, the music, Every room has a, is equipped with a Bose music system, if you're uh, familiar with that. So um, I'm gonna go to the next slide. So you can see the hotel itself. It does have sort of, it's kind of you know private from the rest of the city. They've got a pool, you're overlooking the, uh, uh, the Nile. The hotel also has six restaurants featuring different cuisines from around the world. It's also connected to a mall. So if you want to go shopping and stuff, you can walk over to this small mall. So in Cairo, we'll meet you at the airport. We'll transfer you to the hotel. Uh, first night, nothing going on, uh, simply because it's after a long flight. Check into your room. Um, and uh, in the evening, we don't include dinner in Cairo. We always include breakfast. We always include lunch, but not dinner. And the simple reason for it is because there's six restaurants at the hotel. Uh, plus that shopping mall and stuff, we just figure after a full day of sightseeing, you can have some downtime, you know, met new friends uh, traveling on the tour and stuff like that. So the evenings are left for free. We will have a welcome reception on the second night where a few cocktails or appetizers and stuff, but for the most part, your evenings are free. So uh, you've arrived at the hotel, checked in your room, got a great night's sleep. Next day, Let's start our sightseeing. And the first place we're gonna to head to is the Egyptian Museum. And this is where you'll see you know, the, the mask of King Tut, which is you're looking on the screen here. And who is King Tut? He ruled Egypt from 1332 BC to 1322 BC. And the mask you're seeing here, that was founded back in 1925. 
The Egyptian Museum was built in 1902, and it's uh, it is small and it's getting overwhelming with so many antiquities and stuff like that. So they are building a new museum in Cairo. It's called the Grand Museum. And anything that's in the current Egyptian museum will be transferred to the Grand Museum along with 30,000 additional antiquities that I've never seen by the public before. So we'll, um, we'll spend the, the morning at the uh, either museum We'll do a tour of the museum and then you'll have some uh, a free time. And uh, after the museum, we'll head down to the souk or the big market area of uh, uh, Cairo. It's called the Khan El Kilili Market. And this is sort of where Cairo began. Um, this area has kind of been settled since the 10th century. And this is where the artisans and craftsmen this is kind of where they all settle and they all have their shops and stalls and stuff like that. And we'll do a walking tour of this area. Um, great way of meeting the locals, maybe do a little haggling and shopping and stuff like that. But one thing that's really cool about Cairo itself is this particular area has coffee houses and coffee houses in Cairo have been around since they say about 6, 1760. If you think about it, you know, Caribou Coffee, Starbucks, so on like that. Those coffee shops, houses, they came around in the 1990s, maybe a little earlier in Seattle, but the Egyptians were going to coffee houses way back in the 1700s. So um, it's kind of cool. Make sure you have some local coffee there. We're also gonna have a great lunch down in this area at a beautiful restaurant, uh, great food. And uh, this is a great day of exploring uh, Cairo and the locals. So we'll head back to the hotel that night. Uh, late in the afternoon, uh, you get a free evening again, and the next day we'll do some more sightseeing. And the first thing we're going to do is uh, head out to the pyramids. And here are the pyramids here, built of limestone and granite. The stones weighed anywhere from, uh, I guess, uh, one to two million tons, and uh, one ton to two tons, actually. Stones mostly came uh, from over five, six hundred miles away. How did they get them here? Well, they, they transported them down on the Nile on these boats, but in, it's just, a, and then across land, a remarkable feat, thinking that even to transport a one to two ton block nowadays is a big deal. And these things were like 15 feet long, six feet wide, amazing. Um, number of uh, blocks or stones uh, for each period, anywhere from two to three million stones. How long did it take to build the pyramids? Probably they say about 20 to 30 years. A big question is, um, can we go inside the pyramids because they are tombs? And for the most part, the answer is no. Um, so once in a while, they're open for a day or two and then they're shut down again. And when they are open, there's a guy standing up there, 25 bucks, go inside. Um, but I've been fortunate enough to be in the area when I've got to go into one of the pyramids. And um, it's a challenge to get in there. You know, it's very claustrophobic. Um, you kind of have to get down on your knees at times to crawl in and down these steep stairs and dark, humid and stuff like that. But don't go, for the most part, no, you can't go in the pyramid, but we'll visit a tomb later on in the trip that I'll point out for you. The other question I get a lot is, can we do a camel ride in the full? Yeah, you can. If you're going to do it, this is where you would do it at the pyramids. Uh, we don't include it. Camel rides are, uh, camels aren't even native to Egypt, but if you want to do a camel ride, this is where you would do it. All around the pyramids, there'll be camels and their owners wandering around offering rides for a dollar, 10 minute rides for a dollar. You pay them the cash, you get on the camel, you walk around for about 10 minutes, you get some great photos and stuff. And then to get off, they'll charge you $14. So maybe $15. $15. So um, it's kind of fun and uh, uh, popular. The other thing we're gonna hey, do is- Hey Todd, can I get, interject with a quick question? Um, from the chat, how much time do we spend at the Grand Museum? It's probably going to be, I haven't got the exact timing sorted out yet, but I would, it will be half, it'll be the morning. So maybe about three hours, you know, once we start going there, no one's been in there yet. Uh, if it, if it requires more time, we'll have to do it. It's less time. So it's kind of like a, once it opens, they said it was going to open in 2019 and it didn't. Then 2020, they didn't. And now they're saying 2021 at the end of the year. Uh, so hopefully that'll happen. They've actually been planning this museum since 2001. It's taken almost 20 years to get it open. So um, 
It'll definitely be a highlight. I actually have to point out a lot of people have been asking, are we going to the Museum of Civilization? Because a lot of people saw the parade of the mummies on TV a couple of weeks ago. Um, that museum is new also, and there are mummies in that museum. We don't go to that museum now. And the reason is because it's a museum of civilization. And that means the museum focuses on Egypt from the prehistoric times up to present day Egypt. So it covers a wide range of things. And you know, it's, uh, it doesn't focus on ancient Egypt that we're there to visit. So um, that's the story there. And uh, after the pyramids, we're going to head over down to the, the Sphinx. And the Sphinx, the Sphinx itself, pretty remarkable. Built around the same time as the, uh, the pyramids, around 2600 BC. And they say it took about maybe two to three years to carve out the Sphinx. What makes it really um, remarkable is that it's actually carved out of one stone. And the head is that of a, a king, the body is that of a lion. In this case, it's a uh, King Khafre. And then after we spent time in the pyramids, the Sphinx, that whole area, um, we'll head down to uh, the pyramid, uh, or sorry, the Mena House. The Mena House is a really cool place. Used to be a hunting lodge built back around 1860. Hunters used to come down from Egypt and hunt hippos and crocodiles in the Nile Delta. And this is where they stayed. The architecture is really, really cool. They've kind of added a hotel onto it still, but you'll still get the flavor of the old architecture, uh, the hunting lodge back in the day when it was built. So we'll have a five-star lunch um, and uh, time to overlook the pyramids. And then after that, we're gonna visit a old Cairo and then head down back to the hotel for another free evening. Next day, we're gonna transfer to the airport and we're gonna fly down to Luxor. And Luxor itself, uh, this was the ancient capital of Egypt. Pretty remarkable place. So we're gonna fly down to Luxor. Uh, like I said, the flight was about an hour long and then um, we'll get off, we'll transfer to our ship beyond the diet. We have our own private dock in Luxor. Um, and you get on board, uh, check in, get to your room, get settled in, have lunch on board. And then what we're gonna do is head out on our first sightseeing trip. And um, first place is the, uh, the Luxor Temple. And so let's talk about the walking tours and how it works in, uh, in Egypt. Walking tours of all the temples and tombs and stuff you're gonna see, it's gonna take anywhere from one to two hours. So you should be able to stand or walk for one to two hours. The temples themselves are the way they were when they were built 2,500 years ago, 3,000 years ago. So there's no ramps, seating areas, uh, handrails and stuff like that. They've kept it the way it was. Um, if you have any mobility, mobility challenges, um, just if you travel, just travel with an open mind that there may be some temples that you may not be able to visit. Like I said, we do have the elevator on board, but in terms of access to all the temples, uh, if you're uh, in a wheelchair or uh, slow walking, stuff like that, uh, there may be some challenges. We're still working on that, but the, for the most part, you'll get to see everything, And uh, but travel with an open mind that um, there may be some things that you wouldn't be able to go in and see. The way it works also with these walking tours, so actually 68 guests on board, we have three Egyptologists. And uh, so what we do is we break the 68 into three groups, 20 to 23 guests, and you get your own Egyptologist all the way through the trip from Cairo on the cruise and back. Yes, we have an AMA tour director or a cruise manager that travels with you the full 12 days, but you also have your Egyptologist and the Egyptologists are licensed. They've been university educated, uh, licensed from the government, I said, and they'll kind of be your guide for the, the whole trip. And when you do these walking tours, uh, of course, we'll always have headsets so everybody can hear. So bring good walking shoes, don't forget your sun hat and bring sunblock. Another uh, place, this is kind of a unique visit and this is the tomb of Queen Nefertari. Very, very few people get to see this tomb. Uh, Queen Nefertari, um, who was she? She was, well, she was the first queen of King Ramses II. 
She's considered the most beautiful. She was smart, educated, she could read, she could write. She died at the age of around 45. King Ramses died, they say anywhere between 65 and 90 years. In, in today's years, that's like 150 years old. So he had a good, long life. Uh, when she died, uh, this is the tomb that uh, King Ramses had constructed for Queen Nefertari. Um, and the reason very few people get to see this is because it was pretty much left alone up until the 1980s. And then they started digging into it in the 1990s. It's what they kind of came across and stuff like that. But if you go to other itineraries and, uh, to Egypt and stuff, you don't see Queen Nefertari's tomb on itineraries. And the reason for that is just to get into this tomb, um, it's about 130 US dollars per person to get into this tomb. And uh, it's included with all my waterways, uh, but, and you also have to have a special time to go into the tomb. So it's very rare to see it. This is something that will probably stay with you for the rest of your life once you've been in here. And you can look at the colors and think of King Ramses. When you go in there, you'll see little poems, stories, handwritten on the wall to Queen Nefertari from King Ramses. So it's a pretty cool place to visit. Um, so this is the uh, tomb of Queen Nefertari. I put this temple in here, the Temple of Horus, um, uh, simply because of, well, the reason temples are so well preserved in Egypt is because they were abandoned for thousands of years. Desert took over and they were covered in sand dunes. And this particular uh, tomb itself is the, temp uh, sorry, the Temple of Horus built around um, 2030 BC. And it was founded by a French archeologist back in the 1860s. Again, it was below us. He was just digging around. He came across something hard. And he kept digging, 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 got more people in there. And eventually they found this tomb or temple, the Temple of Horus. And uh, again, so no one even knew it was there because it was covered with a massive sand dune. All right, uh, the Nile itself, uh, interesting fact about the Nile is that when you're on the Nile, temples tend to be on the wet east side, tombs on the west side. And why is that? It's because in Egypt, they didn't say sunrise or sunset. They said um, the birth of the day, when the sun went down, it was the death of the day. So tombs are on the west side because that's where the sun sets and that's the death of the day. Temples on the east side where the sun rises. Um, so they had to kind of all figure it out. Another neat thing we're gonna visit are the Anubian village. They live mostly for the most part on the islands of the southern part of the Nile. And who are the Nubians? Um, well, they were actually the first settlers in Egypt. They probably settled in Egypt around 8,000 BC. That's like 5,000 years before ancient Egypt began. And um, Nubians are incredible people and you can look at their homes. They're so colorful and they have drawings and carvings on the outside of their home. And uh, there's a reason for that because each home you pass, you'll see the beautiful colors, you'll see the beautiful carvings and pictures. Those carvings and pictures are telling you uh, the history of that family that lives in that home. When we're on the village, in one of these, vill this village, uh, we'll do a walking tour with the locals, we'll visit the, the market here. And other companies visit Nubian villages along the way, but they'll visit there for 40 minutes and they head back to the ship for lunch. We're actually going to take it one step further where we'll visit the village, hang out with the locals, this is the market and so on, but then we'll also have lunch in the village with the locals. So it's a really great local interaction. And, you know, we know that when people come home from trips and stuff, you know, they've seen some amazing sites, but usually the first thing that comes up is the wonderful people that they met, meet along the way. All right, Abu Simbel, I had pointed this out uh, earlier in the trip and Abu Simbel was a really uh, special place. It's about 200 miles south of Aswan and the only way to get there is by plane. And Abu Simbel was built by King Ramses uh, for uh, Queen Nefertari and it was built on the banks of the Nile. And there it sat, used for about a thousand years and then it was abandoned. Then around the late 1950s, early 1960s, they were building the Aswan Dam um, on the Nile or the High Dam. And the lake that was gonna form behind it or did form behind it is Lake Nasser. 
that lake as it rose was going to cover Abu Simbel. So what the government did is take this, the temple apart, brick by brick by brick, moved it up the hill 900, uh, 900 uh, feet, and rebuilt it again. And you can kind of see there up in the top uh, right-hand corner, Abu Simbel overlooking Lake, lake Nasser. And you can also see temples, they did have a lot of color in its day. Of course, the colors are worn off. You can see that in the lower right-hand photo. But what makes Abu Simbel really um, uh, special is um, with uh, King Ramses on, well, here's the thing. When the sun comes over uh, the horizon um, on February 21st and October 21st of each year, the first rays shine through that door and onto a statue or drawing of uh, King Ramses. February 21st, October 21st, what are those significance of? Well, uh, October 21st, or sorry, February 21st was King Ramses' birthday. October 21st was his coronation. So not everybody gets to see Abu Simbel and it's sold as an optional because it, it is kind of expensive. It's an optional trip of about $325 to $345. But remember you're flying down there on a jet uh, flight takes about 45 minutes and then you have two hours at this uh, temple with the tour and then you have to fly back to Aswan. Um, companies don't include it because of the price. We sell it as an optional like everybody else, but the difference is you can pre-book Abu Simbel with AMA before you head out on the trip. Um, so you're guaranteed a seat on the plane. Other companies will sell it once you're on board and it's kind of like first come first serve. So if you really want to see Abu Simbel, uh, you can be rest assured that you will see it with Alma Waterways uh, because you pre-booked it. We're kind of working with the airline to have our um, the seeds. So first time I saw Abu Simbel was kind of like the first time you see the pyramids or the Great Wall or Machu Picchu. You know that feeling you get, you know, you, uh, it's that type of feeling. So I strongly encourage if you uh, take this optional trip. If you don't take it, uh, we have free time in Aswan for about four hours. Uh, another temple I'd just like to point out, I'm just pointing out some of the most popular uh, highlights of the ones that we visit along the way is Komombo. And Komombo uh, built around 330 BC, it's about 30 miles north of Aswan. And Komombo was uh, dedicated to Sobek, who was the crocodile god, and Horus, who was the falcon head god. And you can kind of see their two entrances, one for Horus, one for Sobek. But what makes this place even more cool is that uh, this is where you'll find a lot of mummified crocodiles. Uh, Karnak Temple, this is the biggest temple. And back in the day, this was the place to go to in ancient Egypt. Um, massive temple that kind of kept adding on and adding on to it over a period of 1500 years, uh, adding to the temple. You can see the size of the columns and stuff. This is actually where you'll end up with doing a two hour walking tour of the temple. So this is Karnak Temple, pretty special place. So that's kind of like uh, just pointing out some of the highlights along the Nile. And if you remember, like if you go to Europe or different places around the world and uh, you've been there for about a week or so and seen a lot of churches, plazas, cobblestone alleyways and stuff like that, everything is great, beautiful. Even by the seventh or eighth day, you know, it's exciting to see all these things, but wouldn't it be nice to see something different? And that's kind of what we've done here. When we fly back to Cairo, uh, we're going to actually visit the presidential palace and this the presidential palace was built back in 1860 and um, you call it the Abdeen Palace actually 1873 when it was built still used as a private residence for the president and this is where uh, when dignitaries come from overseas and stuff like that this is where uh, they will stay and there are actually some very small museums in the palace, like a historical clock museum. Uh, you know, there's even a small museum that uh, shows the gifts that dignitaries have brought over the last 125 years or so, a little art museum. So we'll tour the palace. Again, you don't find this included with any other companies just for us to get into this palace. Again, $180 per person. So this is a special place that very few people can see but we'll also take it one step farther and uh, we're gonna have a farewell lunch in the palace. So lunch and a tour of the palace. Um, and it's gonna be like a festive farewell lunch because this is your second to last day. Most flights back to North America 
um, leave early in the morning from Cairo. So we thought that maybe we need to leave the evening free before you uh, fly home just to get ready, the anxiousness getting packed up and stuff like that. So we're gonna do sort of a celebration um, uh, during the afternoon. And then afterwards, we'll head back to the hotel. Uh, you have your free evening, get ready for your flight home and so on like that. And then on the last day, we will transfer you back to the airport in time for your flight home. I know a lot of us have been uh, at home for a long time and looking for things to see and stuff. So here's a documentary I will recommend. It's called The Secrets of the Saqqara Tomb. This is on Netflix, came out about five, uh, five months ago. And this is about a tomb that they did find, recently find near the pyramids. Um, and during 2019, they spent a year digging into the tomb and, you know, Along the way, you find different things as you work your way in. And this documentary chronicles in uh, what they find uh, in the tomb as they work their way in. They only have a limited amount of time to explore this tomb because of government funding. Um, but the suspense builds up and up and up until uh, the end. So I won't tell you anything more, but if you're looking for something to watch about Egypt, Secrets of the Saqqara Tomb. I don't want to take up uh, so much time with everybody, but I, I what I extensions before and after. One night is uh, four nights in Jordan, which is two nights in Amman and uh, two nights in Petra. And this is Amman, incredibly historic city. And uh, we spent two nights at the St. Regis here. Uh, some of the statues in Amman uh, date back over 7,000 years. And Amman is a population around 4 million cultural and economic hub of Jordan. We'll also visit uh, Petra. Um, Petra is an amazing site. It was made famous, I guess, in that movie, Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade. Uh, this is the treasury. We'll spend two nights down in Petra. And uh, Petra is probably settled around 5,000 BC. Flourishing city of 30 to 50,000 people, 800 monuments or structures. It was abandoned in the second century uh, due to uh, uh, change in trading routes drought, um, uh, earthquakes, different things and stuff like that. And then it was discovered again back by a Swiss traveler um, in the 1830s. It became a World Heritage Site back in the 18 or 1980s. So that's four nights in Dubai that you can do, uh, or uh, Jordan. The other option is three nights in, to Dubai before you uh, head over to Egypt. And Dubai, a massive city, a bought, built out of nothing on the Persian Gulf and uh, it is a pretty crazy place and we'll spend three nights in Dubai. Amazing architecture, some of it is you know, out of this world, some of it could be a little cheesy and stuff, but it's pretty cool to see and it's a great way to uh, break up your journey to Egypt. And, um, you know, we'll tour uh, Dubai itself, we'll head out to the desert, do a sand dune tour, um, we'll have dinner out in the desert one night and then one day we'll head down to uh, Abu Dhabi, about 80, kilom 80 kilometers southwest of uh, Dubai, and we'll visit, tour this city. And you'll also see the Zayed Grand Mosque. Uh, this is a massive, beautiful mosque uh, built in the 1980s. It's not old, but the architecture is spectacular. We're there on a Thursday, but if you were there on a Friday, you'd be in this plaza with 40,000 other worshipers. And then finally, um, the option that you can do after Egypt is head over to Israel for four nights. And we'll spend four, uh, four nights in Jerusalem. And our extension is to basically um, just touch on the highlights of uh, Israel. I mean, if you're, uh, Christianity is really important to you, you're probably going to go to Egypt for 10 days, two weeks, or Egypt, Israel, and really explore. Uh, if you're Jewish and you want to explore uh, your heritage and religion of the in Israel, you'll probably head over there for 10 days or two weeks. We're just touching on the, you know, the highlights of it, like the tomb of King David. We'll visit Bethlehem, visit the Jewish quarter, we visit the local market. And one of the cool things that we will visit is also we head out of Jerusalem for a day and visit Masada. Um, Masada is a Hebrew word meaning strong foundation built around 30 BC by King Herod. It was, it's a UNESCO, UNESCO World Heritage Site. Um, this is kind of where you know the elite went to get away from it all back in the day. And to get to the top of Masada, you gotta uh, get up in a cable car and you can kind of see that on the left-hand side of the hill there. And we'll do, do a talk, walking tour of Masada. Look at the water in the background. After Masada, we'll head down to uh, the Dead Sea. 
And um, this is, of course, the Dead Sea is famous for because its salinity is almost impossible to sink. And we're going to go down to a resort. We're going to have lunch down there. And if those that want to get into the Dead Sea for a quick swim or read a book or anything like that, you'll have the opportunity uh, to do that. So that's our uh, time in Egypt. And um, again, we start sailing in September of this year and we open for sale in 2023, probably about three or four weeks. So the next thing I wanna uh, talk about is our Chobe River or the Africa uh, Wildlife Cruise. And the Chobe River itself is located on the border between Namibia and uh, Botswana. And you can see kind of the location of uh, the Chobe River uh, here in Southern Africa. You'll see other spots on the map like Cape Town, Johannesburg, Tanzania. Those are on the map here because those are places that we will visit along the way or you have the option to visit. Our ship is the Zambezi Queen. It's a small boat, only up. They're all suites, 14 suites, three levels. And uh, the Zambezi Queen, the crew is local. Um, I can tell you that right now, the local crew, amazing. Their uh, smiles are infectious. The Zambezi Queen is an eco-friendly ship. And uh, we do have a restaurant on board and uh, uh, you can see it here. Uh, the food on the Zambezi Queen is, can be local, but it can also be continental. The chef, to be honest with you, like I said, the crew is local uh, Namibian. They come from the villages around the river and they work on board for like two weeks on, uh, uh, one week off. The chef um, and her son, they come from a village and her and her son are the cooks in the kitchen. Uh, she's a great cook. She's got her big knife and stuff like that. Um, and uh, you can always have gluten-free, vegan, so on like that. Uh, food is local as well as, like I said, continental. Also on the Zambezi Queen, it is uh, like an open bar. So for the whole time while you're sailing, local beer and local wine, local spirits are always included. So wine with the meals, no problem with that. South African wine is probably uh, the most common wine on board. And um, the bar itself, well, it's kind of like a, a small bar. There's Moses there and um, definitely he'll, if you want a glass of wine, no one, he'll do his best to take care of you. If you'd want an international drink like Canadian Club or something like that, uh, they charge like $5. So, but local whiskey, no problem. The lounge itself, uh, you can see it's a spectacular, calming view. I have to admit that uh, I'm a pretty hot, intense kind of guy and I keep having to go, go, go. But by day two on the cruise here, um, I'm pretty mellow now. And just looking at the view, it's kind of like, watching, I don't know, an animal show on National Geographic or something like that on a huge screen, but a billion times better. Um, really relaxing. I should say on the, uh, the Zambezi Queen, it's not like a cruise that you would do like in Europe on a river. Every day is a new port of call. What we're doing is exploring 40 square kilometers of the Chobe River and uh, its environs. picture of the deck and stuff like that. We got, there is a splash pool. You can see the river there in the middle. You kind of see the ship is over on the right-hand side. And there's a reason for that is because on the Chobe River, um, because of the size of the Zambezi Queen, the Botswana side of the uh, river, they don't allow this size of boat uh, into Botswana. So we cruise along the Namibian side, but then in the morning and the afternoons, we get in these smaller boats and we head into uh, Botswana and we explore all the tributaries, the channels and so on um, of the river. And people say, well, when is the best time to go down here? Well, we only cruise during the best time. This is from March through November. During December and January, kind of like the green season or the wet season. And um, we don't cruise there. And there's a reason for that. It's because during that time, the river levels are higher. There's also a lot of watering holes within Chobe National Park. Um, and the grass grows tall. But once the rains stop in February, um, the watering holes in the park dry up, so all the animals have to come down to the, uh, the river, plus the grass dies, and so you have a better chance of viewing the animals. The suites on the Zambezi Queen, they're all suites. There's two different sizes, a private bathroom, king size, or queen bed. They all have a balcony. Um, on the Zambezi Queen, uh, we 
finally got Wi-Fi. This is an isolated area of the world, satellite Wi-Fi. I have to honestly admit the Wi-Fi works best if you're up on the top deck on a clear night, which is where usually you're gonna be. There are no TVs in these rooms. There isn't really TV in this part of the world. Your TV or your viewing is the outside world. And in the morning and afternoons, we will head out uh, to explore the animals and so on. Um, you can see a lot of elephants here. In fact, the Trophy Park has more elephants per capita than any other part of the world. And uh, you can see the boats that we go into. Well, we'll carry like eight to 12 guests on uh, each safari boat. Um, most of our guests don't get up on the roof, but you can if you want to. You can kind of see a little white cooler there on the backside of the boat here. And during your safaris, you can help yourself to water, a glass of wine, a bottle of beer and stuff as you're doing the safaris. And also, uh, you know, if we're out for two or three hours, you don't need to worry about using the restroom and stuff. Each boat has a small little porta potty that you can use. So here's some pictures during the downtime, during the afternoon, if you're not out on safari, you can go fishing, you can visit a local village. It's all kinds of different things you can do. You can just relax, read a book, watch the view as we cruise down the, the river. Look at all the zebras here. And actually I put that in here because number one, uh, zebras are my second favorite animal, giraffes are number one. Also, they discovered uh, the migration of the zebra. There's, you know, you have great migration up in Tanzania. They found that there's a zebra migration in uh, this part of the world. And uh, the zebras here do a circular uh, track of about 300 miles through Botswana and Namibia. And uh, so you will see a lot of zebras in this area. Uh, let's see put in this picture here simply because this was actually taken by a guest of ours a couple of years ago and it does give you an idea of how close you do get up to the animals. What happened to this heron I had no idea but hopefully he got away. We'll also do a day safari into the heart of Chobe National Park which is where you can see lions, giraffes, buffalo and so on like that and we'll also have a picnic lunch inside the, the park. So that's our, uh, the cruise itself is four nights, five days. But before you get on the cruise, you've got to start somewhere. And for the most part, 99% uh, of our guests will start with our program in uh, Cape Town, Cape Town on the southwestern tip of South Africa, city of about 4 million people, always one of the top 10 cities to visit in the world. The setting is absolutely uh, spectacular and it's a super multicultural city. People from all over the world have settled in uh, to Cape Town. And when we're in Cape Town, we're going to stay at the Cape Grace Hotel. You can kind of see that up on the top right hand side. It's a small hotel. It's only got 80 rooms, um, five star hotel. And if you go to the top hotels rated in the world and so on like that, often you'll come up with the Cape Grace. Beautiful hotel. Our rooms look over the harbor. There's a whiskey bar and there's a swimming pool in the hotel. Um, again, complimentary Wi Fi. There's an elevator in the hotel. Um, beautiful, beautiful five-star service. So in uh, Cape Town, when you arrive, again, we'll meet you at the airport, we'll transfer, private transfer to the hotel, and you don't need to buy our air through us, everything's included, and uh, you don't need a visa for uh, South Africa. And so we'll arrive, um, and then that evening, we will have a welcome reception, and uh, then the next day, we're going to head off on our sightseeing, and first place we're going to head out to is the Cape of Good Hope, and often people think this is the southernmost tip of Africa, but it's not. It's kind of like the south, southern southwest tip in Africa. Still, it's a significant point. And it's because when trading from Asia to Europe, you know, back in the 1400s, 1500s, so on like that, when they came across the Cape of Good Hope, they knew they had made it the halfway point. And if you look at the bottom left-hand corner there, you can kind of see the, there's a lighthouse there out on the tip. One side of the, uh, the point is the Indian Ocean. On the left-hand side, that's the Atlantic Ocean. And what's really remarkable because of the currents and the way they work and so on, the left-hand side of the Cape of Good Hope, the, the currents come up from Antarctica. And so the water is much colder than on that right-hand side where the currents are coming in from the Indian Ocean. In fact, the water difference temperature can be up to uh, 20 degrees. So after the Cape of Good Hope and the light, also we head over to a beach called the Boulders Beach. Um, Boulders Beach, famous for its penguins. Uh, these penguins were Antarctic penguins that washed up on shore in the 1980s. 
I don't know, I don't know how many washed up on shore, maybe 15 or 20 of them. Um, anyways, they made Boulder's Beach their home. And today, if you go to Boulder's Beach, you'll find two to 3,000 penguins. And they're starting to make their mark in Africa. Uh, they're moving up the coast through Mozambique into Namibia. They've evolved into their landscape and their environment so quickly now, they're actually called, instead of Antarctic penguins, African penguins. Um, so we'll spend time there. We'll also have a beautiful seafood lunch out on the, uh, 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 out on the Cape. And uh, then we'll head back and you have a free evening um, at the Cape Grace. And uh, a documentary I'd like to recommend, again, is uh, uh, this came out recently. It's actually up for an Oscar now, My Octopus Teacher. And what makes it really cool is this is a guy's relationship with an octopus off the coast of Cape Town. Actually, it's off the coast of Boulder Beach. Um, great documentary. Um, and now I have to move octopus, octopi, up to one of my favorite creatures in the world. Incredible documentary. Um, good way to uh, disconnect from the world for a couple of hours. So that's our first day out there. And then the next day, you have a choice of two things. You can visit the Winelands, a full day trip. It's kind of like if you were going from San Francisco to Napa Valley or Sonoma Valley for a day. This is what the Winelands are. They're about 50 miles outside of uh, uh, Cape Town. We'll visit two wineries. One's organic. And you'll get all the different uh, tasting. We have a wine expert, Katie. She goes with you. She's actually got a doctorate in, it's not called wine winology, but something like that. Great sense of humor. Um, and she knows her stuff. So we'll spend a day. You can spend a day out in the Winelands, beautiful lunch, tasting menu, and so on. Or you can head over to Robin Island. And this is Robin Island, just about an hour located off Cape Town. This place was uh, like it's been kind of like a prison for 400 years, a place of quarantine when people had to go to when they first came down to settle in South Africa. Um, um, this is also where Nelson Mandela was imprisoned. And, um, you know, when Nelson Mandela was in this particular prison, he, um, is a, he you see his cell. But the warden at the time, his name is Christo. And actually, even though um, Nelson was in jail there, he became good friends with the warden. And uh, it wasn't really, and so they, they developed a great relationship. And when finally, when Nelson Mandela actually got out um, and became the president of South Africa, him and Crystal remained friends. And so when you do this tour of, uh, the prison, for the most part, on most dates, Crystal is going to give you the private tour of the prison. So he will tell his relationship uh, with Nelson Mandela. And also for Nelson Mandela, he was the guy that, you know, started the, the, up, um, the protests and so on like that. And apartheid, what was apartheid? Uh, it was where the white minority white government told the blacks where they could uh, live and what jobs they could have the colored or the mixed, they can only live in this neighborhood and these jobs. And then the whites, which is only about 5% of the population, got the best jobs in the best neighborhoods. And that was apartheid. And with 95% of the population in, in um, South Africa is, uh, you know, different races and so on like that, the uprising and finally in 1996, um, apartheid ended, Nelson became president and took South Africa on to a a uh, different path, and uh, it's pretty cool to see when you're down there. The um, After the prison, uh, we'll visit Bocap. Bocap was where uh, the first part of Cape Town was settled. Um, unfortunately, back in when they were building Cape Town back in the 1600s, they brought slaves in from mostly Malaysia and uh, to help build the city. And this is where um, uh, they settled in the Malaysians and so on, like that's a Muslim community super colorful, we'll visit Bocap. And this is an area of Cape Town that very few people get to see. Whether you go on the Winelands or whether you go uh, to Robin Island, everybody will have the opportunity to head up to the top of Cable Mountain. And this is the cable car. Out in the distance there, you can see uh, Robin Island. So three nights in Cape Town, four nights on the ship, and then we're gonna head over to Victoria Falls, which is about 90 miles away down the river. Uh, from where you were on the Chobe and one of the great natural wonders of the world. And the hotel we stay at is called the Victoria Falls Hotel, beautiful five-star hysteric hotel built, uh, I guess, in the late 1920s by the railway. Um, if you've ever been up to uh, the Canadian Rockies and you see those big hotels like the Fan Springs Hotel or Chateau Lake Louise built by the railway to bring tourists in, same idea here. 
right away to bring tourists up uh, into uh, the hotel. So we'll spend two nights at Victoria Falls. We'll explore the falls. We'll even do a train journey um, one night. We'll do a sunset cruise. Lots of things going on at the hotel. And then after the Victoria Falls, you have uh, some options. Number one is take a three or four train journey on the Robus Rail down to uh, Johannesburg. It's beautiful, most luxurious train ride journey in the world. And uh, it goes through Zimbabwe. Your rooms are uh, like hotel rooms, deluxe rooms. Uh, you get your own queen bed or two twin beds, have your own private bathroom. The service is five star. It stops along the way. You'll do a safari one day, visit villages and stuff like that. Um, and this train journey is the way it was, you know, uh, back in the 30s and the 40s. They've re recreated it. The train is old like that. Uh, there's really no Wi-Fi on the on the train. And even for dinner, you've got to dress up. Men have to wear a, a jacket and a tie, women a cocktail dress or pantsuit, because that's the way they did it in the 30s and 40s. And that's, uh, that'll take you down Johannesburg. If you don't take the train journey, you uh, will fly from Victoria Falls down to Johannesburg. And this is uh, Johannesburg, largest city, one of the largest cities in all of Africa. Um, it's a city on a go. I think maybe back in the 19, early 1990s, say 20 years ago, city kind of got a bad reputation, but it's changed. It's a city on the go. It's got a thriving art scene. Um, the trees here you see on the left hand side, I put this in there because those are actually jacaranda trees. And jacaranda trees actually grow in Southern California also. So it kind of tells you, gives you the idea of the climate of Johannesburg. What a lot of people don't realize is Johannesburg actually is 5,500 feet above sea level. And um, so the climate, the climate is pretty temperate. And when we're in uh, Fair, uh, Johannesburg, we're gonna spend two nights at the Fairlands Boutique Hotel, beautiful, five-star hotel with a park-like setting. You've got a pool, one of the best spas in all of Africa. The rooms you stay in are called the Chateau Suite. Every room has a different design. So when you check into the hotel, everyone's running around looking at each other's rooms to see if they got the Asian theme, I don't know, the European theme, all kinds of different things. And when we're in Johannesburg, um, we're gonna do a day trip down to Soweto. Soweto is one of those townships that the white government told the black population, this is where you have to live. Soweto, South, West Township, that's what it's short for. And when we're in Soweto, we're gonna visit a place called the Cliptown Youth Project. And I found this accidentally. I was with Lucky, one of our local guides about four years ago. I go, Lucky, let's go somewhere where nobody else goes, <clears throat> something different. He goes, well, let me introduce you to my friend Tulani. Excuse me. So we went out to, to uh, uh, <coughs> Cape Town or uh, Soweto, and I met Tulani who had the, started this youth program, kind of a school area for the, uh, and what his goal was to get kids to go to school, get them educated and get them prepared for university. So they'd go on to university and then they would you know, get out of Soweto, get a great job, live in a different part of the city and stuff like that. So that's his goal. And when I first met Tulani, uh, basically the story is he kept looking at his watch and he's telling me about what he's trying to do and so on like that. And then about an hour, he says, Mr. Todd, I gotta go, I gotta go. And I go, Tulani, where are you going? And he goes, I'm going to Atlanta. And I go, Atlanta, why are you going to Atlanta? He goes, I have really no idea, uh, but it's my first time on a plane. I'm going all the way to Atlanta. And I go, what's there? And he goes, well, something called CNN Hero of the Year Award. Somebody nominated him and knew him. CNN picked him and he flew him to Atlanta. They did the big interview on TV and stuff. He didn't win, but it was kind of a cool experience. And guests sometimes want to bring things. Uh, you don't need to, we donate to the, uh, Put down and Tulani and stuff like that. But I did ask Tulani, some people really do want to bring a gift or something for the school. And I go, what do you need? And he goes, well, if you, umbrellas. And I go, umbrellas, why would you need umbrellas? And he goes, because kids won't come to school if it's raining. So that's why he needed umbrellas. So it's just simple things like that, um, that can make a, a school or a community thrive. So that's Tulani. Um, also, I'll recommend a couple more documentaries. Here's one's called The Lion's Share. It takes place in Soweto, where uh, Tulani lived, but back in the 1930s. And The Lion's Share is about that song, The Lions Sleep Tonight. You know, we in the jungle, the mighty jungle. I always thought it was a Disney song, but it not. That song originated in uh, Soweto back in the 1930s. You can see a picture of the band here now. And so they do the progress of what the song, how it started, how we evolved through the decades interviewing the family today. 
But the ending of this is not quite what you think. So um, the lion's share, if you're looking for another documentary, and this one's on Netflix. After Johannesburg, we can, we'll head out to Kruger National Park for three nights, or you have the option of that. This is where you'll see the big five, leopard, lion, rhino, elephants, and the water buffalo. And when you're out in Kruger Park, uh, you have the option of staying at two different lodges, and one of them is Tinsal Twal Safari Lodge. These are small lodges, uh, only six, seven suites um, at the lodges. Tinswalo Lodge comes with a private pool in each suite. It overlooks a dry riverbed. You can see that there on the right-hand side. So if you get a thunderstorm or something in the distance, water comes down the, the uh, dry waterbed. Um, you know, find elephants, tigers, or elephants come down, <clears throat> monkeys and so on like that, down to the dry riverbed. The other option is you can stay at Makani Lodge, Game Lodge, and uh, very similar to Tin Swallow, but it, they don't, the suites don't come with a private pool, but the suites are larger, so you get more space instead of the pool. Suites overlook a, a sort of like a dry grass plain that you can see there on the left-hand side. Look in the far distance, you'll see a watering hole. You'll find hippos uh, in the watering hole. There you'll wake up call in the morning with their <clears throat> grunting, stuff like that. There is a pool at McConney Lodge, and you can see it there up at the main lodge. Seven suites at the Connie Game Lodge. And you'll do morning and afternoon uh, safaris at both of the lodges. Everything's included, your food, your drinks, your safaris, stuff like that. The only thing that's not included if you wanna visit the spa. You don't go to Kruger, you have one other option, and this is to head over to uh, Tanzania for uh, three nights in the Serengeti. And um, so you'll do a kind of a safari, private safari. There's only six guests on each vehicle. Um, uh, on the ways you have your own guide and we stay at really interesting places on your seven night safari. Uh, the first one is Terengi Treetops Lodge where you get to sleep up in the trees. Um, again, this safari is kind of like how the movie stars back in the 30s and 40s did their safaris um, in Tanzania. They stay at these really unique places and they're all five star. So two nights sleeping up in the trees where you do morning and afternoon safaris. And every again, everything's included at these lodges, the food, the drinks, and so on, like the safaris. <clears throat> of course, we'll visit uh, the locals, the Maasai, um, and uh, very colorful. Uh, they have their own villages. They definitely know how to jump. And uh, it's, it's a great experience. The other place we spend two nights at the Engorgoro uh, uh, Crater, and we'll stay at the five-star manor of Engorgoro. It's kind of got the Dutch architecture the rooms are like cottages, very large cottages. Um, and when we're at the Ngorgoro Manor, we'll do a full day trip down into the crater of Ngorgoro Crater. This was a, an incredible place to find wildlife. Um, it's like 2000 feet below um, where we're staying. And so you head down into the crater. Um, I remember looking, first time I was there, we were at the top of the crater and I looked down into the lake in the crater and I didn't even know there was a lake because it was just pink and it was pink because of the flamingos. So it wasn't until we got down there that I realized there was water down there. And um, when we're down in the crater, explore the different areas, the waterways, and also have a beautiful lunch, uh, outdoor lunch down at the base of the crater. After Angora Crater, uh, we're gonna head over to the Serengeti and we're gonna stay at the migration camp. This is a luxury five-star tent, tented camp, very small again. And uh, we'll spend two nights in the Serengeti uh, and then we'll fly back to a place called Arusha where you can fly back home to North America. Um, often guests ask, well, the Serengeti is amazing any time of the year, but if you wanted to see the migration, you can never guarantee it. Migration's getting kind of funky now with the climate change and the warmer temperatures and stuff. But for the most part, uh, end of July through middle of September is when you kind of see the, you may see the migration going to this part of the world. You know, the wild buffalo, uh, water buffalo crossing the river and the crocs are there to catch them. That's the great migration, the wildebeest migration. And finally, the final option you can do is head off to Rwanda uh, for four nights. And uh, this is Rudy and Christine, the owners of our company. Um, and they went there back in 2018. And this is a picture of them. Christine there on the top left-hand side, she came back and she was telling me about her story there to see the gorillas. And when she's telling me her story, she did say to me, it was probably the most 
emotional or incredible experience of her life. And as she's telling me, when she, see, when she saw the gorillas, actually tears were coming down her eyes. I mean, this is a mother, kids, marriage, all kinds of different things. But to her, this was the experience that um, you know, she'll take to the grave, if that makes sense. Um, and to give you an idea of the trekking, trekking takes anywhere from 90 minutes to could be a couple of hours to go see the uh, gorillas. And you can see how the trekking is. Gorillas live at about 8,000 feet up. So it's a higher elevation. And so if you do have altitude sickness and stuff, this probably isn't the trip for you. Um, the gorillas themselves are endangered. A day, just a trekking fee to just go see the gorillas on one day, government charges $1,500. It's a lot of money. But um, the reason for that is number one, they're trying to save the gorillas. And number two, your guides are actually the former poachers of the gorillas. So they need to pay them well so they don't go out there and start hunting the gorillas again. So this is Rwanda, four nights. And uh, finally, uh, one last documentary, Virunga, uh, local word for uh, volcano. And uh, this is the actually the experience of how, um, you know, the, I don't know how to say it, like the, you know, one time the poachers and the gorillas and stuff like that, and how that evolved to where they saved the gorillas. It's, uh, it's tough for me to watch in the beginning, uh, but by the end, it's okay. So again, Netflix, Virunga, um, if you're looking for another documentary. Um, so that's my presentation. Um, this picture of the Zambezi Queen again. And um, we're gonna head on to the next slide and I'm gonna bring Mary Margaret back to us. And Mary Margaret, if you have anything to say or you wanna point something out or Ted, go for it. I'd love to, can you hear me? <laughs> you can. Oh, good. Well, because you uh, listened to this wonderful, wonderful journey uh, through Egypt and into Africa um, this, this afternoon, this morning and this afternoon, if you book any new 21, 22, or 23 Amawataways journey, all right, with your Travel Leaders Market Square travel advisor, of course, by the 28th of April, I will put an additional $100 per person discount on your invoice. So an incentive to keep dreaming and to do it. To, yes. keep, to keep dreaming, yeah, certainly. What, what incredible destinations we went to and, and it's too bad you can't combine them all into one trip. You could, you oh. could spend uh, months in Africa, but thank you, Todd. That was sure. absolutely, that was fascinating. Oh I think the, the one time I went to a Chinese restaurant and my fortune cookie said, you want to go to Egypt. Really? You will go to Egypt, but it said you want to go to Egypt. And so um, watching this certainly reinforces that belief and, um, you know, Southern Africa mm -hmm. and the, the Chobe River mm -hmm. and all those different um, extensions before and after the cruise certainly presents some incredible opportunities really to tackle that bucket list. Um, you know, Ted, uh, like my job, I've always been in product development uh, my whole career. And I've worked for a couple of tour companies and cruise companies. But because of my job, it's taken me to a lot of different places around the world. And this wasn't bragging, I can tell you that right now, but I've been to 88 countries. And that's, and I, to me, that sounds like jet lag, economy seats, it doesn't sound, it's not glamorous, but it was my job and I enjoyed it. And of all those countries I've been to, I can honestly say, I've always said this, Egypt is in the top three. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I, I think so. There's, there's just so much, so much there and so much history. And, and Todd and Mary Margaret, you both mentioned that um, 2023 sailings are um, becoming available pretty quickly. And I think it's probably good to let the folks on the webinar know one of the reasons why that's happening. And I think that's because 2022 is turning out to be a very, very popular, popular <laughs> um, year for travel. Yes. And so, you know, these, these trips and, and especially on the very, very small ships like the... Um, Zambezi Queen um, will sell out, are sold out in some cases, and will sell out certainly very quickly in those most popular times of the year. So if this is something you've been dreaming about, if it's on your bucket list, um, please reach out to your travel leaders, travel advisor, and we would be more than help, more than happy to help you um, 
make these dreams a reality. So Todd and Mary Margaret, thank you both so much for the presentation. Thanks to everyone who joined us. I am gonna go ahead and um, end the recording. And